Welcome back to the show, Lucas. Stevie, what's up, man? Uh, just uh, enjoying my time in uh, quarantine at the moment. Well, in self-imposed quarantine to a certain degree. I mean, we're not we're not being asked to shelter in place like our friends over in California, but all essential services have been closed down and we're all basically being asked to spend as much time at home as possible. And this podcast is a great example of that because you live less than a kilometer away from me, but here we are doing this via via Skype. Yeah, the harsh realities, man. We're just all, um, I don't even know what people are up to now. Like, I feel like a lot of people are just sort of um, a bit stumped and a bit like confused. You know, mm. I think a lot of people are just like, where to from here? Like, where's this going to lead us? Look at the impact it's having on our economy. And I feel like a lot of people are going to go crazy as well. I saw one of your blog posts actually. Yeah. How to not go crazy. Yeah, how to not go crazy during lockdown i think uh it's uh i will add that one to the show notes for our listeners but it is um important uh, particularly if people kind of rely on their day-to-day -day routine going into the office seeing people you know all the distractions of daily life not to go crazy and then if you find yourself staring at four walls day after day after day after day potentially for months on end and you know if you're not intentional about how you cultivate um, some time in your day to take care of your emotional health, you can find yourself sleeping very, very quickly. And I know yeah. you've been just going for a lot of walks. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm just like literally, because I usually wake up early like yourself, you know, get up at like 6 or 5.30. And I'm just like, the first thing I think of when I wake up is like, ah, oh, you know, like I rush to the gym, get my workout done, start the day. But instead, man, it's just been like, all right, what am I doing? Lying in bed, okay, uh, the gym's shut, uh, all right, don't panic, don't panic, it's all right, you'll yeah. be okay. And then it's just like, uh, yeah, might as well just go for a walk. So I've just been walking around the block, starting in the morning. I'm actually finding it's still quite a good way to start the day. It's quite refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's good but because um, actually when I head outside, the sun starts to rise and I can catch a glimpse at the sun, literally looking at the sun for like 10 to 15 seconds. Yeah. Which is um yeah, there's a whole have you heard of have you heard of like sun gazing before? Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. us about the benefits of sun gazing, it's particularly early in the morning. Yeah. Um well the biggest benefit is um the fact that well with the UVB light it enters through our photoreceptors in the eyes and it helps to like synchronize our circadian rhythm. So it's probably the best practice to do in the morning to help with melatonin production later on in the evening. Like mm -hmm. it's a really good way to like, you know, just it sort of signals to the to the body that it's, you know, it's time to wake up. It's time to release all the um, the energizing hormones like cortisol, the other um, neurotransmitters and all that in the morning just to get things going and stuff. So, um, and the other thing about that, there's a lot of documentaries on, I haven't really looked into like the scientific data behind it, but like sun gazing in general, um, seems to reduce people's appetite as well. It has a pretty potent like appetite suppressive effect. Like yeah. it's not like, you're, I don't know how, but, um, it's pretty cool how it has, um, that sort of effect. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned that cause, um, Rick Rubin, the uh, legendary music producer who, you know, he worked with the likes of the Beastie Boys, Slayer. Um, you know, he's worked with so many artists over at Def Jam. He was at one point, I believe over 300 pounds and, the one big change he made was rather than staying up all night recording uh, artists, he started working towards a daytime schedule and getting up early in the morning and going for a 20 to 30 minute walk early every morning. That was the only like one big lifestyle change he made. But by doing that, he actually lost like 150 pounds or something. Like he's now just a thin, you know, shadow of his former self. And he credits it to just getting up early and going for a walk in the sun. Um, yeah. but it also just helps us boost our general disposition, our, yeah. you know, it puts us into a better mood. And, um, I wrote about this the other day, um, in an article on remote working, you know, don't just roll out of bed and, you know, groggily walk over to your desk, get outside, go for a 15, 20 minute walk, get some sun. Cause it can make all the difference to, um, how you perform and how you feel, uh, during, during the day. Yeah, it really has. And the other thing is like, the start of this year, one of my goals for 2020 was literally, literally to do um, after dinner walks every night. And the reason why I set that as a goal is because 
I found some studies showing how going for these ten minute, three ten minute walks every day is equivalent to taking this anti diabetic medication. Like, and I was, it took it, it took me to find that study to be like, oh, well, I'm going to start doing this, and I started doing it, and now I've actually got this running joke. Um, it's called the metformin walk. Like the drug name is called metformin. So mm-hmm. I just message my friends and I'm like, yep, just going on another metformin. You know, like it's just like our little saying now. So, so how many uh, steps are you um, smashing out every day now? Um, I would say I'm reaching at least 15,000 15, minimum. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I'm breaking it up as well. But the other thing is, man, like I'm, I'm also consulting at the same time. Like I'm, um, I'm able to like check, uh, make calls. So that's like I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm able to like the other morning I had a consultation with a guy from India, and it was literally six a.m. in the morning. I was, <laughs> it was literally dark outside as well. So I was literally walking around this dark park, you know, um, on on a phone call, like getting my steps in whilst like doing a consultation. It was really funny. It was fun. <laughs> It was a fun start to the day. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And I think it's something that people can perhaps learn from if they're not already doing it. You know, whenever you do have a phone call meeting, you know, there's no reason to be sitting down at your desk desk taking that call. You know, you can get up, go for a walk, take it while walking outside, um, particularly for people who normally under the world's normal circumstances say things like, I don't have time to, to do that. I would never be able to get 10,000 steps in a day. Man, if you're spending two, three hours a day in meetings, on the phone, there's no reason why you can't take those walking, right? So yeah. I think that's a it's a big one for people. And and sometimes I find that while you're walking, um, your cognition is actually optimized, or, or your level of alertness is yeah. greater, so that yeah. you have a more uh, meaningful conversation with that person as yeah. well. I, I've definitely noticed that as well. Like compared to my general calls, like when I'm sitting down here versus when I'm going for walks, it feels like I've just got way better clarity along the walk. And it's probably just like related to like oxygenation and blood flow. And um, yeah, it's it's cool. Like it's having a pretty good effect on um, the consultation itself. Like mm. on the call, it's like actually really, um, it's a really good use of my, my time. Um, but that's also another really good, thing for people during this 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 chaotic period is like introducing these walks is something that's going to help with the immune system like mm-hmm. it's going to help and the re- the way it's going to help is via um stim- stimulating and activating the lymphatic system so that's like our You've probably heard of like lymphatic massage, like a lymphatic massage or lymphatic Please draining and enlighten me and our audience at the same time yeah, so basically um, the lymphatic system is like our – It's like it runs alongside our blood vessels and basically what it does is it helps to filter out toxins and um, chemicals and, and wastes from the body. So to stimulate that, the body needs a mechanical pump, like a mechanical pump action and that is achieved via like minor muscle contractions or like just in general muscle contractions. So like – I'm um, going for a walk. Will contract the muscles in the calves and the quads and the hammies and the glutes, mm-hmm. and that is a mechanical pump. And what that does is, is it helps to stimulate the lymphatic system to help detoxify, to help cleanse the blood, um, to cleanse out the impurities, things like that. So uh, you can either u- use that, or you can go on a vibration, like a vibration plate you know those vibrational therapies the um yeah the vibro trainers like they're pretty good for stimulating yeah the lymphatic. I, I think in the current climate most people probably won't have access to a vibration plate but going for a walk <laughs> is definitely something everyone can do and um i guess this brings me to um our conversation today which is all about yeah. immunity and uh you know before we go any further this is a great time for me to just throw out a uh, disclaimer and say that anything we say on this show today is not to be intended as a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health or personal advice and that people listening should always seek the guidance of their doctor or other qualified health professionals with any questions they may have regarding to their health or medical conditions. So with that, I guess, um, you know, we are here to talk about 
immunity, boosting our immunity, particularly in light of COVID-19, which is a type of coronavirus. I mean, other ones were, say, SARS was a type of coronavirus. I think sometimes people think this is a standalone virus. It is a family of viruses. Um, it's different from the flu. Um, and from what we can tell, based on the data that has been published, it's about 10 times more dangerous in terms of mortality. However, those numbers are fluctuating and it's worth... Uh, it's definitely worth emphasizing that this is a rapidly evolving problem, a rapidly evolving space. Nobody really knows exactly what's going on, when, when we're going to come out of this, what the mortality rate is exactly, because there's only so much testing being performed. We don't know what the denominator is. But what we do know is there's been a hell of a lot of work done in the past few decades on immunity, on different things we can do to boost our immunity, whether or not that will help us in the face of COVID-19. We don't know. But I think in these times, uh, one thing that people can do to at least quell the anxiety that they may be feeling is to just take whatever control they can. Um, and so if that means eating better, sleeping better, um, exercising and moving, like you were saying a few moments ago, if that's going to help us boost our immune system somewhat, well, then we should definitely be trying these things and also trying to get our loved ones to do it as well. Because if it yeah. can help, then why not give it a shot, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess a good place to start um, prior to going live, we we're talking about sleep. Now, sleep for me is kind of like a, a meta habit. Like if you get your good eight hours of uh, sleep in with a good two to three hours of say deep, uh, you know, rapid eye movement sleep, that tends to flow on into other aspects of life. Your, your performance is a lot greater. You're emotionally a lot more regulated. You're a more pleasant person. What does sleep do for us, Lucas, in terms of our immunity? Yeah, it's it really should be the number one thing that I think people should be trying to optimize currently. Mm -hmm. uh, well, regardless of any virus, right? Like we should. It doesn't doesn't matter if we're talking about immune health. Yeah. It doesn't matter if we're talking about sports performance, like you alluded to before. Um, but I think definitely the link between um, poor sleep and immune health is very very well documented, and basically. Um, accumulating sleep debt, like lack of sleep, will just generally speaking increase the number of sick days at work. Um, and we know that. We know that's a fact. And there's many there's many reasons why and how this 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 like this happens to us. Um, one of which is actually simply just the the counter, the compensatory effect of sleep deficit, sleep deprivation on somebody's hormonal system. So we know that sleep de deprivation leads to a rise in cortisol the mm -hmm. following day. And we know that cortisol is an immunosuppressive hormone. So we know that chronically elevated levels of cortisol will lead to downregulation of white blood cell production. It will lead to dis dysregulated blood sugar levels will lead to a whole oh, a hoax of um, negative metabolic effects. So mm -hmm. um, that's just one mechanism. But then the other the other one is like um, just the, the simple fact that uh, sleep itself is a restorative process. And if we're not giving our ch our bodies our, our body a chance to enter into that deeply restorative state, then how do we? How the hell do you think that? We're going to be able to um, uh, reorganize the organ systems. How are we going to be able to um, fight off any infections? Like it's just going to have a – it has a strong downstream effect. So I think like sleep should be the number one thing. And and I've, I, I've spent – I mean I just did a, a seminar the other – a few weeks ago talking about how to optimize sleep. Um, and I've actually – I've got a uh, – I've got a free sleep webinar coming up for – for your audience, if they want to mm -hmm. check it out, that should be going live this Friday. What's the link for that? Yeah, I'll send that across. It's going to be a brand new landing page on my site. Cool. Um, we'll, we'll add that to the show notes for the listeners there. Yeah. Yeah. People derive a lot of value from that. Yeah. Talking about it's um yeah. just sorry man I just wanted to jump in and just touch on cortisol and stress levels because from yeah. what i have read the majority of our uh deep sleep takes place 
uh, towards the latter end of an eight hour sleep cycle. So you were talking between six and eight hours is when you get most of that deep sleep, which is um, critical when it comes to that emotional regulation that we're talking about and that, that uh, management of those cortisol levels. But a lot of people listening to this might be only getting, say, six hours sleep a night or less, in which yeah. case they could be waking up feeling sluggish and groggy and and really ir- irritable, um, if nothing else. Um, yeah. And I guess if we want to fight this thing, I mean, we're seeing some of the uh, fatalities come through. Now, the majority are older people. However, um, there are there was an 18-year-old who, who died the other day in Italy. There was a 34-year-old who died from the States. And sometimes it's a matter of people having previous medical complications, suppressed uh, immune systems. Um, so what, whatever we can do in this case to keep that immune system firing. Uh, and if we can only do one thing, I would think that sleep is probably that that one meta thing we can focus on optimizing if nothing else we talk about in this podcast. Yep. 100%, man. Yeah. 100%. So, I mean, people can find out more about what they can do in your webinar, but maybe we'll give them a couple of things. Uh, yeah. I mean, before you go to sleep, maybe turn the lights off or dim them because the even something like five lux from what I understand can suppress the release of melatonin. And so you can find yourself laying in bed for an extra hour or two struggling to get to sleep because you had the lights blasting. You're sitting within two meters of your uh, TV while you're watching the latest uh, episode of stranger things or whatever the case is. Um, and yeah. that is all going to suppress your ability to fall asleep. So either yeah. dim the lights or maybe get yourself a pair of um, blue blocking uh, glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a simple practice that, you know, two, three hours before bed, they can start to chuck on a pair of blue blocking glasses and that'll help with the melatonin production later on in, in the evening. But I always say that sleep, preparing for sleep starts as soon as you wake up, you know, as soon as you yeah. wake up, that's that should be when you're, you're trying to optimize sleep. And that, for me, mm. is what I mentioned before with the morning walks. I've already prepared for sleep tonight because I've actually already done my 10 seconds of, of um, sun gazing. Like I've already been I, – I did it maybe not 10 seconds. I probably did like five seconds. But that sunlight in the morning when I was doing my workout at the playground, I was just trying to catch the sun between the trees and I was um, – I got a glimpse at it and it was just enough to, to, to hit my retina – um, and I know that later on this evening, at least I've got that, that morning dose of vitamin D through the eyes and then, um, that's going to help with my sleep. But yeah, just on yeah, vitamin D, I think it's worth calling out for some people, um, who might be falling into the trap yeah. of say taking vitamin D supplements before they go to bed, which again, is just going to keep you up, right? hundred percent. Yeah. So let's just think about it. Like from a, from an evolutionary point of view, I mean, like the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening. So like it does not make sense to be dosing your vitamin D tablets after dinner, which a lot of doctors do prescribe and a lot of um, physicians still mistakenly prescribe. But I really think that's absolutely counterintuitive. And there is, and uh, one of our, one of our famous biohackers, uh, Dave Asprey did some, did some objective testing to see whether or not this was having an effect. And, he tried vitamin D before bed and he noticed distorted, disrupted, compromised sleep. So mm. it's just, it's nothing. It's yeah. Long story short, if you're taking vitamin D, make sure you're having it after breakfast in the morning. That's like, or, or maximum, the la- the latest time you can take it is at lunchtime after food. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I try to take mine early in the morning, and we'll we'll talk about supplements during this episode as well. But um, just a couple of other quick things on on sleep. Um, you know, avoiding super engaging content before going to bed, like not looking at your phone and you know scrolling Instagram for hours upon end before going to bed. Maybe give yourself thirty minutes before. You go to bed where you don't look at screens. Uh, you can try and journal. So if there is anything on your mind that's giving you a sense of anxiety, I find that just taking that, writing it down kind of transfers it or transplants it from my head onto the paper and just gives me a little bit more of a clear head as I try yeah. to fall asleep. And uh, speaking of supplements, perhaps magnesium as well uh, yeah. before you go to bed can can help you um, calm down. So, I mean, what's the um, research on magnesium and sleep, say, Lucas? 
Yeah, magnesium is a very – it's a very versatile mineral that um, is most beneficial to be supplemented before bed. But actually, I break this down in my, in my, in my sleep webinar where I actually go into detail into like different types of magnesium and how some of them can actually be energizing and some of them can be actually – uh, relaxing so mm-hmm. it really does matter on like i'm getting into the very specifics but in general magnesium on its own is 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 a um a calming relaxing mineral um however it's always bound to another uh chemical so like you don't just take magnesium yep. if you want to do that just that's like instead like think of coconut water like let's look at coconut water and so there's we know there's a lot of electrolytes found in coconut water but the magnesium that's found in coconut water is just magnesium, right? But whereas when we're supplementing with these magnesium supplements, they have to attach the magnesium to another molecule. So what they do is they'll put it with oxide, citrate, glycinate, taurate, all these different amino acids and other chemicals. So, And that, that, that attachment, that other chemical, really influences the actual physiological effect of the magnesium itself. So... So what what should people do then if they're wanting to take magnesium to opt into that calming effect in order to get a better night's sleep? What should they be what kind of magnesium should they be taking and should they be taking it with something else to improve the absorption? Yeah. So magnesium glycinate is quite a good form. Mm-hmm. Um, making sure that they use magnesium with vitamin B6 that can also help because um, the B6 helps to shuttle magnesium into the into the cells. And the same goes for taurine, that that devilish amino acid that's found in Red Bull that we're all so scared of yeah. is actually very, very healthy taurine. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's like – yeah, that – that, that's, that's basically like, it. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So we'll um, we'll uh, add links to supplements and all that sort of good stuff in the show notes so people can know where to pick this stuff up. Fortunately, grocery stores and chemists are still open if you wanted to pop down and pick up some of this stuff too um, in the real brick and mortar world. And um, uh, just another quick tip on falling asleep. Uh, sex actually has been shown, or, or at least a powerful orgasm has been shown to equal a two to three milligram shot of value for a male which is probably why uh, a lot of males tend to um, just want to crash out after after sex so um, that's you know if you don't want to get those supplements well there's a more natural way to go about it <laughs> yeah that that, that- <laughs> That makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, so with that, we'll probably move on and talk uh, a little bit more about supplements, moving on from sleep. Um, I've got a whole bunch of supplements here. There's a bit of a stack. I've got my krill oil. I've got my vitamin D. What else have we got? We've got some BPC, body healing compound. Nice. Uh, Some apple cider vinegar with the mother. What else have we got? We got Omega B complex, probiotics, and vitamin C. So this could just be a supplement immunity stack, or it could just be a placebo stack. I don't really know. All I know <laughs> is I've been taking all of this stuff for a really long time, and um, I tend to maybe get sick once a year. Knock on wood. Hopefully that's the case, and usually yeah. it's for a day or two, and. Um, I, I tend to get back to my best quite quite quickly. And obviously, it's not supplements alone, but that is a reflection of, I think, exercising, getting your steps in, uh, eating well, sleeping well, um, having good relationships, doing work you enjoy. Generally, having a positive disposition will help you to to, to get sick less, I, I, I think, um, holistically speaking. But um, I'd love to just unpack some of these supplements, perhaps yeah. talking with like A, B, C, D uh, yeah. supplements and what they do for us. I mean, we've kind of touched on D already, but what about vitamin A? Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you Let's start with vitamin A because vitamin A is well. Do you even the supplement? You don't even. You wouldn't be having vitamin A supplements, are you? No, not vitamin no, A supplements. They, there you go. Well, there's the there's the one that people neglect, and they neglect well, it. That's only because I ran out. Ah, so you're actually taking vitamin A? I I, like, I did. Although I haven't taken it for about a month, so it's right, okay. The problem is when you have like ten different little containers of supplements, it's easy to um to forget that one is missing yeah fair enough (laughs) 
Yeah, well, what, vitamin A really is like alongside vitamin D. So let's break it down. So uh, vitamin A, D, E, K, mm-hmm. A, D, E, K, they're all fat soluble. And all the B vitamins and vitamin C are water soluble. So what does that mean? So basically, it just means that they're best, they're basically best utilized and absorbed either with fats or uh, or with or they don't need fats. They can be consumed and absorbed with water. Mm -hmm. So vitamin A, I mean, vitamin A is basically the, the, the best vitamin to, to fortify and, and, and build our epithelial cells. So like, that's like our first line defense cells. So the skin, like that helps with, that's why vitamin A is used for skin, you know, improving skin tone and, um, skin color and um, helping with tanning. Like think about, you know, carotene, car- mm-hmm. bet- carotene, better carotene. That's like a, that's a vitamin A, a precursor. So that's why it's used to help with tanning. Um, but yeah, vitamin A has. So if I smash like a whole, uh, whole container of vitamin A tomorrow, I'll be like three shades darker or <laughs> I could stop tanning, stop going in the solarium. Yeah, you could do that. And then you'll, you'll, you'll reach uh, some beautiful liver toxicity at that dose. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I would. So, um, so yeah, so vitamin A. Yeah, in general, vitamin A is, um, like I said, best for our immune defenses. It helps to rebuild the gut as well. Helps like with gut, um, intestinal, intestinal. Basically, remember our gut is. We know it's our second brain, but we also know that our gut is home to majority of our immune cells as well. So. Mm-hmm. Um, anything that strengthens the gut, like you mentioned before, you had BPC one five seven. That also yep. helps with um, regenerating the gut and repairing the gut. Um, so yeah, vitamin A is quite good. It works alongside, but it needs to be balanced with um, vitamin D and vitamin K. So um, I personally, um, well, yeah. There's been some research coming out that vitamin A during this, you know, this coronavirus um, may actually be not so advantageous to use because it upregulates the ACE2 receptors. Have you? Because with the coronavirus, one of the ways it actually enters the body is it actually has to dock onto these ACE2 receptors, and these ACE2 receptors are found in the tongue in the uh, and in the lungs as well so like that's how that's why that's why that's why people are saying um that's why people are basically saying you know cover your mouth with this you know stop the sneezing because the virus enters through it can enter very easily through the oral like transmission yeah um but um yeah but in terms of like vitamin a's general function and um it's it is one of the hallmark vitamins for <clears throat> maximizing immune health, but so is vitamin D. Now, vitamin D is like vitamin D is not even a vitamin. Like vitamin D is a hormone. It's a hormone. It's very like it influences over a thousand metabolic processes processes in the body. Um, so vitamin D is one of the ones that most Aussies actually fall short on. <clears throat> like they're not getting enough of. Same with the U.S. population as well. Um, so there is a sweet spot for like keeping the vitamin D levels. Like you want, if you really want to optimize for vitamin D, the best way to do it is to take blood tests, uh, every maybe quarter or mm-hmm. like six months and, um, making sure it's in that sweet spot. There is like, I think it's 50 to 75. I'm using the U S metrics, um, for maximizing immune health. And then we have our own range here. I think it's like 100 to 150 is yeah. ideal. So um, you talked about gut health a, a few moments ago as well. And, you know, we, we mentioned BPC-157. Uh, we've got probiotics as well. But I think something people everywhere can take advantage of is just fermented foods and, and, and yogurts and things of that sort to uh, boost the um, diversity of, of bacteria in the gut, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so avoiding... So we can introduce so like two ways of looking at it, mm-hmm. input and depleters. Like let's say like inputs are like the, the sauerkraut, the fermented foods, um, <clears throat> all of these prebiotics. And then the other assault or the other 
The other variable that's influencing gut health is things that compromise the gut, like things that take away from gut integrity, gut health. And they are things that irritate the gut. Mm -hmm. So carbs, that, simple carbs, basically, right? Yeah, or is that one sugars, thing? Yeah. That's that's definitely one. Simple sugars, they feed candida and yeah. they, that candida lit, releases acetaldehyde and makes you feel drunk half the time. Mm. Um, so, is, this, is this why like um, the elimination diets or the elimination aspect of fasting and or say uh, carnivore diets is perhaps yeah. what's beneficial as opposed to just say eating meat? It's more so the fact that you're no longer eating all this stuff that's just terrible for the gut. Exactly. Exactly right. That's like, you know, uh, Paul Saladino, the carnivore doctor um, who's really leading the way with like the carnivore diet research and stuff. He does emphasize exactly what you say, like these these nutri these um, chemicals and toxins found in plants, like oxalates, lectins, all these other chemicals are actually compromising the gut. And really what they're doing is because they're irritating the gut, they're actually triggering an immune response. So the immune response is, is, is what's causing the damage, um, is what's causing like overstimulation of the immune system is is the issue. Um, I think um, like even from a perspective of f focus, for example, I used to think, and I could be right about this, but I could be wrong that by fasting in the morning, it would make me more focused. But it also might be because when I was having breakfast, it would usually be like a cup or two of oats and um, you know, quite a bit of carbs to start my day. And so I would just feel sluggish afterwards and my gut would just be, you know, not quite right, um, on the back of that. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is like with that, with the high carb brekkie, um, it's going to get you through for like a couple of hours, but yeah. like, do you, do you find that you would get hungry like maybe three hours later or something or like, yeah, by about 10, 10 30, I'd be be hungry. Whereas nowadays I've been fasting in the morning for probably two years now. And I usually don't really get hungry until after midday, 12, 12 30. Yeah. And even then it's not like a piercing hunger. Like I could push it to two or 3 PM if I really wanted to quite comfortably. Um, so like we're recording yeah. this at 11 45 AM right now. Um, and I'm not even remotely hungry. So I've had a coffee and that's about it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I wish I could, I wish I had that, um, that lack of that lack of hun hunger in the morning. I mean, um, yeah. So we go back onto the the vitamins, like touching back through some of the yeah. The so key we vitamins. we talked about A, D, E, K. I mean, yeah. everyone's talking about vitamin C. I think that's just the staple that pretty much everyone has in their um pantry. But why is vitamin C uh, useful in this case when it comes to boosting our immunity? How does it how does it interact with the body? I guess. Yeah, so vitamin vitamins vitamin C is basically our best vitamin to replenish and rebuild uh, our master antioxidant glutathione. Mm -hmm. So the liver creates a few potent, super potent um, antioxidants which help to protect protect the body, and vitamin C really helps to regenerate and re and and um, improve the production of of glutathione like we can we can do this with other we can do this with herbs as well we can do this with coffee enemas mm -hmm. we can do this with other strategies like but vitamin c is just a very very benign very easy way for people to maximize their glutathione status talk to me about coffee enemas <laughs> uh, i personally I, I personally not yet um experimented with them like have you did you tried them before no, or? no. Yeah, one of my one of my close friends uh, definitely s he swears by them, and so does Ben Greenfield. Obviously, like he's yeah. a massive fan of the c coffee up the ass. Um, yeah, <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, but one thing I, I, I we touched on fasting briefly, and um, apparently in the current environment, like fasting or like yeah. smashing yourself not necessarily in the gym, but maybe in your home gym, aren't advisable. Why, why is that? Yeah. Well, let's – so what's the similarity between fasting and exercise? They're both stresses on mm -hmm. the body. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be 
in general, f- fasting for too long, it's different for someone who's already adapted. You're yeah. already adapted to the fasting, so it's not gonna it's not gonna have a negative. It probably won't have much of a negative suppressive effect yeah. on your system. And it's worth saying that what I'm doing is intermittent fasting. It's like 16 hours yeah. uh, off, eight hour eight, uh, feeding window, as opposed to say two or three days of just water. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like for you, it's it's a, it's a, it, you're adapted to it, and you know that it works well for you. But if somebody's like, you know, he's just starting their weight loss journey or whatever, and they want to start, you know, dropping body fat and stuff, and they like. Yeah, maybe I'll start fasting. Well, maybe not because if if you're not adapted to it, you haven't like built your, built yourself up, worked your way into it, then it's probably going to have a negative effect on. It's going to cause immunosuppression. I would not advise f- fasting for people who are already sort of in a fragile state. Mm-hmm. Then fasting may be that final thing that pushes them over the edge and they catch a flu or something. You know, like yeah. It's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. You have to have good vitality and good strength, like yourself, to be able to withstand that. Um, and again, if you're going to start fasting, just make sure you do it gradually, build your way, build your way up into it. Um, and you can get benefits from 16 hours. Like, is that what you're saying before? Like, you do yeah, 16, yeah, yeah, 16 yeah. hours. You get the benefits from that anyway. So yeah, that's enough. All right, one more uh, supplement worth talking about. Can you can you say that? No. Yes. Oh, zinc. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So zinc is. Let me see the. Um, I took some notes on zinc specifically in relation to COVID nineteen, um, and a lot of functional, not just myself, but many other functional medicine doctors are recommending zinc throughout this period because of its known antiviral properties, mm-hmm. um, and specifically inhibiting certain coronaviruses. Um, and then yeah, you, you've re- you said that zinc inhibits coronavirus and artery virus RNA yeah. polymerase activity. Yeah, there's that a means absolutely there. nothing to me. So, what does that actually mean? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not an absolute expert in immune function, but basically, there is at least some efficacy in vivo. So, like in in um in, in rat studies that mm-hmm. um, zinc administration does at least prevent the docking and um, further proliferation or migration of coronavirus within the, the, the animal species itself. Like, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess zinc zinc and, and selenium as well. So don't forget selenium. Selenium is the one that's found in Brazil nuts, like really rich in Brazil nuts. You only need like they say you only need two a day, but I go for four a day. There's no, you're not going to hit toxicity from taking four Brazil nuts a day. Um, yeah. And the other benefit with zinc and selenium is that they both improve thyroid function. And why is that so significant? Well, let's think about this, man. Thyroid function, you know, our thyroid sits here under our neck, you know, just below our neck. Basically, what it does is the thyroid dictates metabolism, mm-hmm. and we know it's very, very well established that um, a sluggish metabolism will increase your risk and susceptibility to infections. So that's why you know when you go outside and you're co- you catch you catch a cold, right? You're going outside, you get cold, and you catch a cold. Well, one of the reasons why thyroid having good thyroid function is important is because the thyroid keeps the having good thyroid hormones keeps the body nice and warm if you've got good metabolism you're warm so that's going to help you that's going to help the body to fend itself off it's just like like you know think about um saunering as well like saunering Mm. jacks up the body temperature and infections and viruses struggle to um to replicate in warmer conditions not all not not all of them, but most of them. So, so if your thyroid's not functioning properly, then you're more susceptible to being cold and catching the common cold, which suppresses your immune system and makes you more vulnerable to catching other things while you're yeah. in that suppressed state, basically. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Awesome, man. So I know, um, you know, we've talked about some of the more widely uh, recognized or known supplements, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, you've shared with me that perhaps people wouldn't be um, as across. I mean, like Nigella, and 
excuse me if I get the pronunciation wrong, but we've got Nigella Sativa, we've got uh, Sister T, uh, things like NAC, Eclunia Cover, uh, Cordyceps, which I have tried myself. Uh, these are things that perhaps most people, unless they're, you know, knee deep in the biohacking space won't be familiar with uh which ones i mean these are obviously all beneficial in some way shape yeah. or form or at least we hope they are what should people be looking at in this space particularly let's start with cordyceps yeah uh is there a, you've, you've had positive experiences with um cordyceps was it four sigmatic or t elixir or yeah uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I've tried both T-Lixer and Four Sigmatic, but I was tr- I was using them both in just a normal uh, state when I was completely fine, and I was just using those to improve my cognition. However, yeah. Yeah, I can't tell you hand on heart whether or not it did. However, I did try a standalone cordyceps, which you gave me when I wasn't feeling that well. When I got back from an overseas trip recently, I was down and out for a couple of days uh, and you gave me that cordyceps and whether or not that had a direct impact, I don't know. Maybe I was already on the mend and it just happened to be good timing and uh, you know, correlation isn't always causation. But uh, yeah, I mean, everything I've heard about cordyceps outside of my own personal experience seems to be quite positive. Yeah. Did I? I think I also combined the cordyceps with um that tea, that sister's tea. Yes, yes. That I gave you. Correct. That that sister's tea is something that I'm actually using throughout this period. Like I'm not using everything on this list, but I'm I am being very religious with my sister's tea consumption. I'm doing at least two cups a day, mm-hmm. purely because I know that I I've researched the crap out of it, and I know like what to expect from it, and I know it's quite benign in that sense, but yeah, I am dosing sister's tea twice a day and I'm always re-steeping the tea as well because you get these um, these herbs, when you re-steep them, actually brings out more of the, the phytochemicals as, as you continue to re-steep it and re-boil it. You don't throw out the tea but the, tea, the um, tea leaves straight away. Mm. So I've got, I've got that linked on my site as well, um, but I'm, I, I am drinking two to three of those a day um, and it does – it. In general, like in the past, like even with my brother, like he's had he's had pretty bad like coughs and mucus and stuff. But it really does – it really helps him turn the corner and, uh, rapidly. Like within 48 hours, we're talking rapid. Um, and this one's po- this one's basically from Sardinia. Um, it's a – it's just – it's quite underground. Like not many people uh, talk – no one in the Western – like no one in Australia really – uh, promotes it or talks about it, but it's it's got its fair share of um, benefits, man. Yeah. So that was combining sister's tea with cordyceps, and uh, we'll have yeah. a link where people can find this product online as well. Uh, yeah. We've touched on sativa briefly earlier as well, so maybe we won't touch on that again, but um, maybe one more with touching on before we start talking more broadly about food uh, is NAC. Yeah. What's, yeah, yeah. What's NAC? Yeah, so NAC is um, N-acetylcysteine. So basically, it's a modified um, uh, it's a modified form of an amino acid that helps to. Remember, I mentioned before, vitamin C helps mm-hmm. to regenerate glutathione. Yeah. Well, basically, NAC is probably actually it's more effective at regenerating glutathione than vitamin C um, because it's literally a direct precursor to help the body create this glutathione. So right. they use NAC in hospitals right now to treat Panadol overdoses. And like, you know, people that have tried to kill themselves with Panadol, they literally use NAC to like re, um, regenerate their liver damage because it's so potently protective mm-hmm. on, the, on the liver. But the other benefit is that NAC also has mucolytic activity, which means that it helps to um, – Break up the mucus and it actually breaks up mucus in the body, helping the body to excrete it. Um, so that's probably, yeah. And the other thing is, NAC is also being used to treat OCD addictions, cocaine addiction, gambling addiction. There's studies coming out more and more about its psychoactive properties and how it influences um, addictive behaviors and all sorts of schizophrenia and all sorts of. Um, cognitive disorders so it's quite big in the in the um, nootropic space mm-hmm. uh, because of that um but it's yeah it just seems to be it's a hot 
it's a hot supplement. It's been hot for the last probably like two or three years. Um, and in the midst of this whole coronavirus thing, uh, where's the study that I linked? It was, uh, yeah. So the, probably the biggest reason why NAC is beneficial for lung, well, basically because it has a strong affinity towards the lungs, helping the lungs because um, mm-hmm. it's used in, in um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But yeah, NAC, basically, long story short, is that it helps the body regenerate glutathione. It reduces mucus in the body because it helps make it thinner. It thins the mucus. And then thirdly, it helps to reduce inflammation specifically in the lungs. And that seems to be where COVID-19 really attacks and like, you know, why are they on ventilators? Because they know that the end stage of the disease, of the of the virus is that it's compromising the lungs. And mm. I don't know the exact causes of death. Have you looked into like how people die from? Uh, I mean, I can't speak uh, as an authority on the topic, but from what I understand in some cases, it is uh, basically uh, suppression of the... Um, of the lungs, essentially breakdown in the lungs. And I think it's also worth calling out that while um, the mortality rate amongst the younger people isn't that high yet, about 40% of hospital hospitalizations in the United States of people between, I think it was 25 to 50. Uh, well, 40, 40% of hospitalizations are of people between 25 and 50, right? So that doesn't mean that you're immune. And also, even if you recover, there is a risk of ongoing um, long-term damage to the lungs, which can suppress uh, your performance in various aspects of life, but also your experience of life. So this is definitely not something that someone who's, say, 25 or 30 years old listening to this should be taking lightly and writing it off as an old person's um, sickness. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. Um, so having touched on a whole bunch of supplements, I mean, we talked a little bit about food and how eating, say, uh, consuming too many sugars or, or simple carbs doesn't really do wonders for our guts. And if we are going to eat that food, then perhaps later in the day is better than first thing in the morning. But um, mm. more staple things that people perhaps have in their fridge or in their cupboard right now could be things like say you know chicken beef uh garlic i mean what sort of household goods might people want to up their intake of in order to boost their immunity yeah um well obviously like the vitamin c rich foods um i think that's important even though if you're supplementing vitamin c um combining it with the other nutrients found in vitamin c rich foods is important um, the other thing is p- increasing potassium intake as well. Mm-hmm. There has been some research coming out about linking low potassium to poorer disease outcome in this whole coronavirus. Um, so, yeah, bumping up the potassium. So that's – and surprisingly, like a lot of people think that chicken – like you'd be surprised, man, but chicken actually contains a fair bit of potassium. Like mm-hmm. these – Meats and beef as well. Like they contain quite a lot of potassium. What about um, so you like don't have organs to... like liver and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, organ meats. In... I've just started. That's the other thing that I've been doing personally. You mm-hmm. know how I said I'm using sister's tea, but I'm also – I've been smashing a lot more um, organ meats recently. In particular, I'm using a lot of ch- – I'm eating a lot of chicken hearts um, to heal Hopefully my Hopefully not while the chickens are still alive. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm eating a lot of chicken hearts at the moment because they're um, they're packed with a lot of vi- uh, zinc and um, B12 and uh, folate and other really good nutrients. So um, the organ meats are awesome. I know they taste like shite. Um, you can say shit can- on the show. That's fine. Um- <laughs> Yeah. yeah. They don't taste great. Like I remember being a seven year old and my mum put uh organ meats into into the chicken soup and um I always just ate around the organ meats. But uh maybe I shouldn't have done that. No. Um yeah, and the other ones like some of the spices and herbs are like um garlic, uh ginger, yep. cinnamon, these are all they're going to improve overall health, not just immune health, you know? Yeah. Like, um, You've also got uh, pomegranate and pumpkin seeds from what I understand. 
Yeah, pomegranates. One of the, I want pomegranate to make a comeback, man. Like it's just been, mm. it's just been ditched. Because it's it's shown like antiviral properties, right, against influenza, which again isn't the same thing, but um, yeah. is something that has been shown to boost immunity against other flus. Yep, and the other thing is like, yes, it's anti, yes, it has antiviral properties, but um, one of the things we know about pomegranate is that it really helps to to modulate gut bacteria. So like, it really has a a positive effect on the microbiome. So like, again. What we eat affects the microbiome. The microbiome affects our immune system. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's that simple. Mm-hmm. Put in good food and you'll have a good a good food equals good microbiome. Good microbiome equals good immune health. Yeah. So. Uh, that, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And I'm, I mean, we're talking about what we should add to our diets, but in terms of detoxification, there's perhaps yeah. things that we want to remove as well. I mean, we talked about carbs, but even things like alcohol, uh, in a time when we're trying to optimize our immune systems, perhaps, you know, you're sitting at home and you have nothing to do and you're like, well, screw it. I'm just going to, you know, swing back a half a bottle of whiskey. It might be fun in the moment, but it's not doing wonders for you, for your immune system. Right. Definitely not. Definitely not. And you've seen the, You've seen on the news, obviously, people lining up at the uh, the liquor stores. Oh, really? Yeah, no, I haven't seen that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know what? I mean, when I, I'm personally not saying don't drink alcohol. I mean, I've definitely had a few glasses, but it's capping it to maybe one glass per night, maybe two if, if I'm that way inclined, but definitely not getting drunk every day because that's not going to do you any, any good. Definitely not. The only, the only exception to that rule for me is – Unless you're creating a herbal extract, go ahead. Like that's that's just you know I'm a naturopath, so like yep. um, we use we 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 create herbal extracts using alcohol. So mm. uh, yeah, there's the benefit there, but definitely not something that people want to be loading up loading up on now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And uh, so we've talked about um, sleep. We've talked about supplements. We've talked about food. Uh, perhaps one thing that's definitely worth talking about. I mean, we did touch on walking, but just exercise in general. Um, even if it's like fifteen to twenty minutes. Obviously, a lot of gyms have been shut down, but that doesn't mean that people can't uh, work out at home. Can't do body weight activities. Um, I mean, we've seen a hell of a lot of. Uh, stories floating around Instagram, all these fitness challenges, you know, 19 push-ups, uh, 10 plyometric push-ups. I want to start one that's like 100 burpees in 10 minutes, but I don't think that will go viral because uh, for the obvious reason that it's 100 burpees in 10 minutes. But um, I mean, how does exercise benefit the immune system? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, get, it, it comes down to the type of exercise, like um, extremely vigorous Extreme mm. intensity is probably not so advantageous um, purely because it's just too much of a stressor for the body unless you're, can, unless you're offsetting that with a lot of um, uh, recovery hacks. Like unless you're offsetting that, let's say you're exercising super, super hard yep. like one of my close friends, um, but then he's, he's doing a good job because he's able to like offset it with – you know, he is doing saunas. He is getting massage therapy. He is eating enough food. That's the other thing. He's re- replenishing enough food. Um, he's got his supplements down pat. Like, it, unless you're um, really diligent about um, optimizing that recovery aspect, then high, high, super high intensity exercise is not going to be so beneficial. Mm. Um, low, moderate, low to moderate intensity activities will only be beneficial for immune health. So like that's, you know, rate of perceived exertion would be, let's say six to seven out of, six to seven out of 10 would be the most ideal during this, you know, if we're we're striving to optimize immune, that's a different thing to we're trying to get fitter, you know, like, yeah, like we, I know you and I, we're always wanting to get fitter. So like, Mm. it's going to be hard for us to not want to be, pushing ourselves to like a nine out of 10. Yeah. I mean, I'm, st- I'm still pushing myself. Like, you know, when I'm 
working out at the playground, it's not a seven out of ten. It's still about a nine out of ten. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not practicing what you're preaching, basically. But um, <laughs> I think I'm in the same boat. I uh, did go pretty hard this morning in in the home gym, uh, but perhaps something that I'll um, monitor as I as this whole thing kind of unfolds and maybe scale back a bit. But yeah, I mean, if you if you can help it, don't try and deadlift. 300 pounds uh probably not going to do wonders for your immune system right now but you probably don't have a 300 pound barbell to access anyways because all the gyms are closed so yeah it's probably working in your favor in some way but um yeah so yeah. exercise and then there's a few other things that we've kind of alluded to throughout the show i mean uh saunas uh is one thing, but perhaps not everyone has access to an infrared sauna like you do, Lucas. But something that most people, I hope at least, have access to is a cold shower in the morning, maybe, um, because that's been shown also to improve uh, the immune resp- immune system's response. Yeah, yeah, cold showers. It's um, uh, like I, I, that's definitely one of the things that I'm still doing. You know, I'm still doing my cold showers. Um, and again, the same sort of – it's a hormetic stress on the body, which means that the body responds, becomes stronger, and adapts. And there's plenty of studies to support the use of cryotherapy and cold showers to mm. enhance resistance to infections, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Probably not so beneficial if you're already sick. You know, if you've already got a cold and you're sick, don't have a cold shower. Like, it's mm-hmm. probably going to make yourself a little bit worse, you know? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I think we've given our audience a massive array of things they could be doing. And like we said at the very start of the show, if there's just one thing they do on this, just try and get a good night's sleep because that's going to do wonders for your immune system. Uh, Before we go, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, Probably the last tip, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard this tip from other functional medicine doctors, is to... Just remember that panicking and stressing is just going to undo all the benefit, all the beneficial things that we've just mentioned. That panicking and stressing over this whole thing is most likely going to ruin and really compromise your immune system just by sheer negative thoughts, like negative, just everything negative about this whole thing. If you're fixated on that and you're in fear, you're constantly watching the news, watching these really intense shows that are like these document these um these news channels that are trying to scare you yeah they're doing a good job at scaring people Mm -hmm. and they they should be like i'm not telling people not to be scared but try not to let that become a thought loop and just dominate your whole day where you're just stuck in that loop constantly just worrying about it like yes we need to worry about it yes we have to take it seriously i'm not denying that it's something that's you know, if we don't if we don't take it seriously, we it will go it will get out of hand. It will become something that is gonna have a devastating it's already have it's already had a devastating effect, but we're just trying to minimize the um the depth and degree of that yeah. impact. No, I totally hear you, man. And I wrote about this the other day whereby you know, something Zig Ziglar once said was you are who you are based on what goes into your mind and you can change who you are based on changing what goes into your mind. So just like with food, what you consume in terms of content will change your dispositions, how you think, yeah. how you feel. And if you're just glued to all the COVID-19 news, um, which is served up by media who is incentivized to you know, bump up engagement, and the best way to bump up engagement is just by dishing out negative news because that keeps people hooked. Then you're just going to be in a really bad mindset, bad frame of mind, um, which yeah. again can be a stressor for your body um, and it can be toxic. Um, I think something like five. I haven't got the exact number in front of me, but it was something like five to ten percent of um, hospitalizations in the United States last year was due to like workplace stress and um, just driving driving the uh, negative outcome, but. 
like you do with food, you know, eliminate the bad stuff, replace it with, with good stuff. I mean, what we're doing right now, we're in isolation, but we're having a conversation. We've got the camera on. It's face to face. Um, call your friends, have video calls, maybe organize at 6 p.m. tonight to have everyone order Uber Eats and just have a, a, a Zoom video call where everyone just talks and, and eats at the same time. Like we've got to do whatever we can to try and make this a positive experience and perhaps even come out of it the other side, better versions of ourselves by picking up some new habits, eating a bit better, exercising yeah. a bit more, maybe reading some books, whatever the case is. I mean, we can see this as a bad thing or we can see it as a good thing. And like the Stoic said, you know, you've got to distinguish between what you can control and what you can't control. And there's no point focusing on what you can't control because that's just going to put you in a victim frame of mind. It's very disempowering, but focus on the things you can control. It's empowering and it's just going to give you a, it's going to get rid of that sense of hopelessness and hopefully give you a more positive frame of mind, bump up the immune system and give yourself the best chance of um, coming out of this, the other side, a, a better version of yourself. That's it, man. That's it. Awesome. Well, um, we'll add um, a whole stack of links to the show notes for this episode uh, where you can find these supplements. Uh, We'll also link a, a Google Doc, which has some more info on the foods that we've talked about. And um, yeah, you can all find all of that over at futuresquare.xyz. You can also find out more about Lucas's work um, over at Ergogenic Health on Instagram. Um, just remind me, what's the uh, URL of the website? ergogenichealth.com.au. Fantastic. And they can also find out a little bit more about a, a supplement you've got in the works called Brain X uh, at brainx.com. Me, brainx.me, which is basically uh, a supplement that is all about improving your cognition and helping you perform at a much higher level in your day to day. That's it. Awesome. Well, Lucas, thanks so much for, for making some time. Um, again, nothing we've said today should be taken as medical advice and you should always consult a licensed physician before taking any supplement. But nonetheless, it is all about doing whatever we can, making like a stoic, focusing on what we can control and doing whatever we can to bump up our immunity um, in the face of this rapidly evolving, uncertain situation we find ourselves in. So thank you again, Lucas. Hope you uh, stay safe and enjoy your uh, your walks. Thanks, Stevie. Speak to you soon, man.